Now, looking at this, Germany versus the USSR. Germany is going to commit nearly 4 million troops to Russia. 4 million out of a force of what? Five plus million? Three out of four soldiers will go to the Eastern Front to be involved with Barbarossa. That means that 4,300 tanks, 4,400 aircraft, 46,000 artillery pieces will be diverted. <coughs> Why can he afford to do this at this point of the war? Britain is not an active menace to him. He doesn't have to worry about the British attacking. So this can be something they can do. The other thing is he's counting on significant support from his newfound allies. Romania, Bulgaria, they'll come into play. They'll com commit forces, and they do 600,000 troops. That's a significant number. Put that in perspective, I think our force in, uh, in the Mideast, Afghanistan, is nowhere near that number today. Probably about half that when we went active with our Iraqi campaign. So you can see that just the, the, uh, the sending of the, the allies in is going to be a tremendous boost. Now, what does the Soviet Union have? On paper, five and a half million troops. Now, that's in the whole army. But you've got to remember that those are also divided up between Pacific as well as Western Front troops. Western Front being the front that we would call Eastern Front for the Germans. Okay? That means that they have probably about 2.9 million troops. They're outnumbered initially by at least a million troops in the first phase. The other thing is they have 20,000 tanks, and this is incredible, 35,000 airplanes. One of the war aims that Hitler is going to do with the Luftwaffe is immediately to knock out the advantages in tanks and airplanes through ag aggressive bombing and attacks on the Soviet airfields. Got to remember that the Soviet Union is not militarily far ahead. They're working off a 1920s, early 30s model. The planes don't have radios. There's no ground support between planes and radios. So you don't have any communications in many cases. The tanks Late 20s, early 30s, model C-17s, not very good. Will fall prey to the Panzers, which are the state of the art at the time. And the idea is that the Germans will attack quickly and fast all across three fronts. Now, this is what kind of fascinates me. This is March 19, or I'm sorry, May 1941, before Barbarossa is enacted. All the dark places are what? German or Axis controlled. You only have whoop, Cyprus, Great Britain, Iceland, and Gibraltar. That's left. Why take on this big nemesis? Could you have done something different? And that's the question that historians keep having. Why did Hitler keep thinking that he could subdue this? Well, that's part of the problem. Your, your, your hubris tends to kick in. He's treating these people as what? Inferior. They're not going to be able to fight. They don't have good leaders. They're cowards. We're better fighting men. We've demonstrated that for now two plus years. We should be able to run right through these guys in close order, fast. He's planning a campaign six to eight weeks long. Well, six to eight weeks, end of June, July, August, wrap up by when? September. Still warm in September, isn't it? At least the first couple weeks. So the issue he's going to face is, logistically, how do I get my troops and my supplies from Germany into Russia? Because what do we have in terms of rail networks in Russia? There are none, or very few, and they're of different gauges. 
and the trains that run in Germany can't run in Russia because the tracks are different sizes, wider or narrower, and that becomes a problem. They didn't standardize railroad equipment back in the day. So each country, you got to the end of the, end of the road to your border, and then you had to change trains and catch the next guy's train. And that's the only way you can get massive products to the, to the uh, front. Otherwise, if you're looking at the next best thing, what are you looking at? Trucks. And that means roads. Well, how many of these roads are paved roads? <laughs> Remember that Hitler is lauded for developing the Autobahn, the first superhighway, which is paved. What do you think is in Russia? We're talking dirt track, two-way tracks that are going to be seasonal roads. That means summertime they're hot and dusty. Springtime they're muddy. And then in fall and winter, probably the sea of mud or impassable because once they freeze again, you got all kinds of ruts and vehicles at that time weren't very good about running over rutted roads. So it's going to be a problem. The Germans will employ half a million horses for logistics. Half a million horses. And in the Keegan book, they talk about these horses you've been following along. The Germans thought a horse ought to be a big, stocky draft animal, like a Clydesdale, you know, so he could pull lots of wagons and lots of stuff. Well, the Soviets, they had these little scrawny horses, right? But those little scrawny horses would eat anything. And pound for pound, they could outpull the German horses. And as the war kept unfolding, the Germans lost more horses. They had greater difficulties keeping the front supplied. Now, what other things are going into this? Germany is feeling material shortages. We talked about the fuel issue. But there's also mineral issues that are going on. They need magnesium. They need other things. Well, the Soviet Union has them. How do we get to those? And that's going to be something. So if you can defeat the Germans, I mean, the Germans could defeat the, the Soviets. They can get the minerals. They can also demobilize, because now you've knocked out your biggest competitor. You don't have to have as many troops standing up right now. And this is becoming a taxing thing on Germany. More people in uniform mean more things you've got to manufacture for the fronts. That means greater deprivation that's going to go on at home. And one of the things that's kept Hitler popular up to at least 1941 is the people back in Germany have not really felt what? The war. Starting in 41, 42, the war will be right on their doorstep. Bombings and deprivation will begin to happen. The other thing is the Ukraine could be used as a grain basket. And that's going to be a big issue. We talk about, there's a chapter 10 of Keegan. We talk about industrial output as well as the calories. And if you don't get the Keegan book, go, go to your library, or we do have some back there. Purchase them. Follow along, because this correlates very closely. If you haven't read John Keegan's book, please do so. And the defeat of the USSR could be a potential of all kinds of slave labor. Move these people back to Germany. They can work the factories while we take the boys and men from the factories and put them into the what? Army. So the backfill has labor. Talk about the defeat of, of uh, Britain and also the oil fields and also the consolidation of Romania and Finland. Now Finland, interestingly, they don't give it up. Remember, they've been defeated in 40. As soon as they find out the Germans are going to attack again, they don't become allies, they become coal belligerents, which is, in other words, you're blooding up my enemy, I'll just stand on the sideline and get a punch in or two in as you're knocking them around. That makes me feel good. But I, when you're getting beat up, guess what? I'm going to walk away from you. That's what the Finns were doing. And it's going to be very critical, especially when we look at Leningrad. Now.